Okay, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Mayor Richard Lowenthal uh, now, and I do have his biography to read, so please sit back and enjoy. This man has many, many accomplishments, and I'm very proud and pleased to be able to present him to you. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal is the mayor of the city of Cupertino. He is a member of the Public Dialogue Committee, the Citizens of Cupertino Cross-Cultural Consortium, or the five C's, the City of Cupertino Economic Development Committee, the City of Cupertino Skate Park Committee, the City of Cupertino Stevens Creek Trail Task Force. He's a representative to the Santa Clara County Cities Association, the West Valley Mayors and Managers Committee. Richard's community activities include sitting on the following boards, the Santa Clara County Metropolitan YMCA, Cupertino Community Services, Cupertino National Bank, the Rotary Club of Cupertino, the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation, the Santa Clara County Library Joint Powers Authority, the Silicon Valley Animal Control Authority. He provides business formation consulting services for several high technology startup firms and is sole proprietor of Lowenthal Consulting. Richard currently is on the board of directors for Procket Networks. From 1996 to 1997, Richard was Vice President and General Manager of Cisco's WAN Access Products Division. From 1990 through 1995, he was Vice President of Research and Development for Stratacom, a telecommunications product development and manufacturing company. From 1985 to 1990, Mr. Lowenthal was co-founder and Vice President of Engineering for Stardent Computers, a high-performance computer company in Sunnyvale, California. Prior to Stardent, Mr. Lowenthal was Vice President of Engineering for Convergent Technologies of San Jose. He holds a BS in Engineering from UC Berkeley, and he lives in Cupertino with his wife Ellen and two daughters. He is an avid golfer and bicyclist. In addition to that, he is a member of the Cupertino Rotary, the Institute of Elect Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the Commonwealth Club, and is a founder of the Computer History Museum. With great pleasure, I give you Mayor Richard Lowenthal. Thank you. Are we live here on the microphone? Okay, good. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's long enough that we ought to be done by now, but I do have a few other things for you today, too. Uh, I'm honored uh, and flattered to be here today and represent our city. Uh, I didn't expect this many people here. You know, I was actually a little concerned because with Sandy's big crowd last year, I, I thought uh, I was at risk of having uh, been shown up. So I used to... Uh, I used to be in awe of the people that, that they allowed up here, uh, the, the mayor doing the State of the City Address. Uh, but now this year I find out they'll let anybody do it. And here I am. Uh, and uh, I was uh, thinking about what the State of the City is. And so I, I took a picture on Monday. The State of the City is clearly uh, cold. <laughs> uh, this, uh, I took, this is my, my wife, Ellen. Uh, my daughter Lindsay and our little dog Skippy, and that picture's just taken up a, a little bit up Montebello Road on Monday. So, my first promise to you as mayor is that within the next six months I'll take care of this problem. <laughs> we'll, we'll get it warm. I want to first. Uh, start out by thanking, thanking a few people, uh, and I, I promise not to turn this into the Academy Awards, uh, but my wife and kids uh, sacrifice a lot to, to have me involved in the city. I'm gone almost every night. I, I have dinner at home maybe once or twice a week. Uh, it's a tremendous sacrifice, and I thank them for it. Uh, I, I know uh, they were nervous when I started. That what, what Ellen told me was, gee, now everybody liked you, because basically I've been a volunteer, and people People like that. Um, and she's, you, know, you get up there, you're going to make some enemies. And why do you need that? Well, she's been very supportive nonetheless. And I think it, we've had a lot of fun as a family with this. Uh, but it is taxing. Um, my fellow council members, uh, past and present, um, we inherited a city in great shape. And uh, there's some of our former mayors here. I see Barbara Rogers there, Laura Lee Sorensen. I'm sure there are more. I apologize for not recognizing you. Um, Kathy Nellis is here, Phil, I see Phil Johnson, 
Uh, you know, it's, it's great to be in line uh, after such great leadership uh, and to inherit a city that's in as fine a condition as Cupertino makes it a lot easier. Uh, we have the greatest staff on the planet. And uh, one thing, you know, Dave must be here somewhere, or he's fired. D Dave, could you stand up? This is our city manager, Dave Knapp. I was asked by a reporter earlier today, what, what are some of the things that make Cupertino stand out from, uh, and be different from other cities? And one of the comments that I gave Joseph was, you know, in Cupertino with our staff, we are always on the same side of the table. We are always shoulder to shoulder and never toe to toe. Uh, and it's, it sure makes the job a lot more fun, I'm sure for all of us, and uh, a great pleasure for me. Um, Dave has had to hire essentially a whole new senior staff. Um, well, Carol Atwood. Carol Atwood, I think, is the, is the senior member on the senior staff. Uh, but we've done a great job in hiring. I want to thank the Cupertino Rotary and the Chamber of Commerce for hosting us today, and finally the voters for putting me in this trouble here. Uh, I want to give a little story about what I think is the best of, of local government. Um, we spend most of our time talking about setbacks and heights uh, and uh, speed bumps and filling potholes, uh, but once in a while we do something important. Um, the one uh, that I, I want to highlight today was a project that I had nothing to do with and none of the politicians had anything to do with, which might be a signal of how we do good work. Um, but what happened is there's, uh, there are a couple of girls in our community, we'll, we'll see them here in a minute, um, that like to walk to school. They don't want to be driven to school. And you know we've got this big push on walkability. And, um, and they, they live uh, in Inspiration Heights, and uh, Molly goes to school at Monta Vista High School. It's about two miles, something like that, a fairly long way to go. But uh, there's an area on McClellan Road, right by McClellan Ranch Park, where there's no sidewalk. Uh, and it's tremendously dangerous, and at one uh, a point they decided it was just too dangerous for, uh, for them to, to come to school on their own anymore. But they didn't just ask for a ride. They went to the city and they asked for help. Uh, and they did more than ask, they persisted. And they got their parents involved. Uh, and the city responded. Uh, and the, the issue was, the place where the sidewalk needs to go, there's a big old oak tree. Now we have one of the dilemmas, because in Cupertino, you don't cut down big old oak trees. Um, and so what, what to do? So um, our public works staff, led by, by Ralph Qualls, who was directly involved in this, and driven by Molly and Emily Williams, uh, came up with a solution. Uh, I was proud to christen it Molly's Bridge which gets them past this tree so that uh, she can ride her wheelchair from home to, to school uh, and with her sister and um, be healthy and happy. So I'd like to bring them up if I could. Oh, in fact, all four of you come up, please. Without a car. So I just want to thank you for persisting. Thanks for doing the right thing. Thanks for all your help too, Emily. And thanks for supporting them. Can I have a round of applause for the Williams? Thank you. Can sit. Okay, so first I want to talk about some of the great things in Cupertino. Uh, the hillside's an open space, top on my list. I like trees. Uh, and so this is a good place to be because we respect trees in Cupertino. Uh, and I, we come from a long lineage of, of mayors and council members who like trees too. Uh, it was a passion of Wally Dean's that our streets should look good, we should have good medians, we should have trees. Uh, and I like it, and I like open space, and it means a lot to me. In the town where my father lives, where I grew up, we were next to open space, 
And I got used to it and like it. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's an important thing to Cupertino. We have award-winning schools. Uh, most, of, most of the people that move here move here for the schools. Um, and we're, we're blessed. Uh, we have uh, the, the number one elementary school in the state uh, within the Cupertino School District. We have, uh, in, in the high school district, we have one that's always in the top about three or, or five. In fact, it's all of the, of the high schools, the, private, the public schools that are not uh, focus schools, it's number one. That's uh, Monta Vista High School. And we have De Anza College, which is a, a treasure for us and, a, and something that we, we love to share uh, with Martha and her staff. We have extraordinary parks. We have our trees. We have a great sense of volunteerism. And this is something else I mentioned uh, to the reporter earlier today. Uh, a nice thing about Cupertino is you love to work side by side with people on community events uh, and on fundraisers, and we do a lot of it. And finally, we have a well-managed city. We talked about that. It sure is good to be in a city where the people in City Hall know what they're doing and, uh, and you can count on the services being provided year in and year out. We've got a short video now, if we could roll that, about some of these things.
our um, IT staff and, and the City Channel staff at Cupertino do a great job. They, they, uh, they put this together. I told them uh, to surprise me with the ending. Uh, they do a very polished job. I don't know if you see the transitions are all on beat and whatnot, and uh, it's just something to be proud of. They're a great, a great bunch. Okay, so you can't have all that much fun without talking about some of the challenges, and we, we do have some. Um, and uh, we are here to cope with them, but we, I think, should, should share them. Uh, the economy. Uh, as you know, we're in a recession, a national recession, perhaps even a worldwide recession. Uh, it affects us all, and, uh, and we need to, uh, to cope with that. We need to be aware. We need to be careful. Here's where our money comes from. Uh, it's a lot of money, $60 million. This is the general fund plus our capital projects and, uh, and funded projects all rolled into one. But if you see, Cupertino is a bit unique in our high dependence on sales tax. Uh, it's the, the biggest contributor. 20% of our money comes from sales tax. What does that mean? That means we need you to go out and buy stuff. Go over to Valco. I know you've got your issues with Valco, but go over to Valco and buy some stuff. Um, because that's how we're funded. Uh, we're, we're somewhat unique uh, in, in, uh, in cities. We were one of the lowest funded cities from property taxes. O only 2% of your property tax comes back to Cupertino. So two cents of every dollar comes here, and the rest of it goes somewhere else in the state. Um, but uh, we can't depend on that. And, and the, the nasty thing about that is that property taxes are pretty predictable. They come in, they, come, they go. Uh, the, uh, the economy doesn't have much impact on property tax, a little bit. Uh, but the sales tax, if you guys get discouraged and don't go out and buy a bunch of Christmas presents, we have trouble. So go buy. Um, similarly, intergovernmental, that, that means mostly money from the state. The state has a big deficit. We went from a big surplus to a big deficit. Uh, the, uh, and the money's at risk. Uh, and, uh, we have to be aware of that. We have to watch it. Uh, in particular, just before our wonderful recession hit, we had a, a, a tax relief bill uh, that rebates most of your vehicle license fee. If you'll see, they still put, because it's a political thing, they still put that on your bill. You know, there's your rebate. They, they itemize on your bill. Um, the trouble is that money wasn't state money. That's city money. So it, it basically came right out of the city of Cupertino, that money that goes back to you. And so the state said, that's okay, we're doing so great, we're gonna backfill the money, which they do, but that was then. Uh, and now uh, we are essentially at the whim of, of the governor. So um, go buy things. All right, the utility tax we'll talk about in a few minutes. That's a tax, that's a local tax uh, that you pay on your utility bill that stays right here. Expenditures, well, what do you know? We spend every nickel. Um, so where does it mostly go? It goes, mostly goes in Ralph's pocket. You know, uh, Ralph, is, Ralph is out there fixing streets and, and building bridges and, uh, and things like that. Uh, it's typical that cities spend most of their money uh, on improvements. Uh, he does take care of parks. It, it says parks and rec there. That's for programs, but Ralph actually does build the parks. Uh, law enforcement, 9%, another big one. Capital projects, that looks like the library, and we'll be talking more about the library, but that's a big chunk here as well. Everything else is cheap. Look how cheap we are, the commissions. Council and commissions, only 1%. We're your public servants. Another challenge, our saturated library. We have the busiest library in the county. Uh, it's full. You can't get a seat. You can barely get a seat on the floor now. Um, so uh, it's full. We're going to build another one. Uh, in March of 2000, we asked you, if you wanted a, a new library, a new $22 million library, and guess what, you, there'd be no taxes. You wouldn't have to pay for it. Well, duh, uh, you get a, get a new library and not pay for it, $22 million library, it passed. Uh, overwhelmingly, people wanted it. Uh, we are now, the challenge is we have to figure out how to pay for it now, and, uh, and it, is a, it is a bit challenging. I think at the time, people were high on the economy. The economy was going great guns and would never end, uh, but uh, things have changed, so that's going to be a little tough for us. So where does the money go in capital? Uh, well, the library is pretty dominant. 
It's a big number, $22 million, the most we've ever spent on a project in Cupertino, the biggest project in the life of the city. Um, and you see it dwarfs everything else. The sports center is kind of poking up a little bit, uh, but the other thing's kind of the normal, normal business, but the library is big and expensive. So what does this mean? Uh, reserves, this is a complicated slide and I will try to simplify it. The orange stuff is real money. So that's stacks of money. Uh, the green stuff, in prior councils, the, uh, the reserve policy, that is what we thought we should have in the bank at all the time, all the time, was uh, linked to the, the budget for the year. And so you see it floats around a little bit. Uh, in the year 2000, we went back to looking at what we might need the money for, and we established a new policy, and that's the multicolored pretty one there. So the pretty one, the bottom, uh, we've got seven and a half million dollars set aside for disasters. That's um, earthquake, uh, you know, or whatever. And we have new kinds of disasters to think about, but we have seven and a half million dollars there in case we need it. We have two and a half million dollars for economic reserve. That's in case, like, that money comes, goes away from the state. If the state decides they can't pay this year, uh, it's about two and a half million dollars. And, uh, and so we have that in case of an, what we would consider an, an economic disaster. And the light blue area is uh, our capital improvement reserve. That's money that we set aside in case we see a great deal we don't want to pass up. It's like the sale at Macy's. Um, it's, uh, typically we use that for if a piece, of pro a piece of open space comes available on the market and we want to take it off the market. So uh, a recent one was the Stockelmeyer property, right? A beautiful piece of property, wonderful historic home, uh, right next to and adjacent to uh, Blackberry Farm. It came on the market and we snapped it up. Cost us $6 million. So we keep a little money there just in, so we don't have to pass up those kind of deals. If you see what the library does to us, we're dipping into that. Let me get the pointer so I don't have to be all lit up. Um, so you see the real money, that's the orange line, is falling down here, below the reserve policy. Uh, and that's part of what we're doing to fund the library. So we're taking a little risk there, but in some ways you could say, well, that's what that money is for, the blue stuff is there. It is an opportunity to do a library right. It is a serious enough issue that we worry about it. Uh, we want the money to back up there. We want it back up above the reserve policy. You see that we operate with a surplus. That's why it does tend up over time, uh, and it is, Right now, uh, in the budget, it looks like in uh, 2007, it comes back to, to the reserve uh, policy. Next challenge, affordable housing. Um, in Cupertino, we have an issue with, with housing. The people that work here can't live here. There aren't enough homes that they can afford. Uh, and there's, there's really two reasons. Uh, one is that we don't have enough, period. Uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is that we ought to have uh, uh, no more than one and a half jobs per house. Uh, we do. We have almost, well, we have almost two uh, jobs per house. So we know there aren't enough pl places to live. But the other thing is they're very expensive. And you see a little problem. This is a good slide. Um, first of all, it's remarkable that the average Income in Cupertino is $110,000. I can tell you no teachers are making that, which is, that's another discussion. They ought to be. Um, but there, there it is, average income. Uh, if we go back just a few years ago, 1995, if you saved all your money for four years and you didn't eat or drive your car or anything, you could buy a house, right? You could sock away $400,000 and buy a house. Uh, now, you'd have to do that for 12 years and you'd be one hungry homeowner after 12 years of not eating. Uh, but it's a crisis. Uh, you can see it's, it's, uh, it's running away, right? The housing prices are running away compared to income. The income looks flat. Well, it's going up a little, but uh, it looks flat because we had to make space on the slide for those $1.2 million average homes. They're coming down a little these days, but not enough. Rents are not much better. They're going straight up. Uh, there's people in the room here that can testify that, people on our staff that had to move out of town because as the rents did that, uh, they can't afford it. Their, their salaries are not going up by uh, 100%. So 
So housing's an issue. Development stress, what does that mean? Well, if we're gonna go fix the housing issue, what we, the state tells us to fix the housing problem, we need to build 2,300 homes. Where are we gonna put those? And where are we, what are we gonna do with the traffic? And where do the kids go to school? Uh, are, we don't wanna go up in the hills anymore, right, to build houses. So we gotta build them down here in the valley. There isn't any space left, so we have to go up. You see, we're, we're nearly built out, right? In, in, um, in homes, 90% uh, of our housing stock is built. So we've got 10% to do. Uh, but all, all of these areas are about the same. We could build a few more hotels. They pay good taxes, which we'd like. Um, but other than that, things are pretty full. So what happens when they're full? You build up or you build out. And uh, we like our hillsides and our trees and our open space. So uh, it looks like if we're gonna solve these problems, we're gonna have to do a little building up. So what happens here? You get traffic, you get crowded schools, the buildings get high. Um, and what we now need to do is be sure that we keep our promise to the existing residents, right? You can't do everything just for the new guys that can't afford a home. We have to keep the quality of life good for the people that are here too. Uh, in fact, in some ways, it's our first responsibility. So on all of these things, traffic and schools and height, we have a responsibility not just to build those homes, but to work with the community to be sure that they fit into our community. Similarly on privacy, we have this thing about walkability and trails, uh, building new parks, putting a skate park somewhere. All of those things push on issues with our current residents. And what we have to do is spend time out in the community, lots of time, years on some of these trails, to work with the residents to find that they fit in and they don't violate your peace of mind, your privacy, and your security. And similarly, a stress from development is the cash reserves, and we talked about that already. Community, um, Bob talked about community at, at, at the beginning of this, and, and this is what I campaigned on. Community is close to my heart. What is community? It's getting out and talking with your neighbors and having a cup of coffee, uh, playing in the park, running into your child's school teacher at Knob Hill grocery store, uh, those are good things. Um, just spending time with your neighbors are good things. Spending time with neighbors that don't look like you is a good thing. Uh, community is important. In Cupertino, we're a little community challenged. We are community challenged. Why? We don't have a downtown, right? Our downtown is a big intersection, Stevens Creek and De Anza. Uh, and we have an, an orientation toward the automobile. We are basically set up to be a bedroom community where you get in your car in your garage, you push the garage door opener, you back out, you go to work, then you come home, get in the garage, close the door, and you don't ever go out and see anybody in your neighborhood. Uh, you don't go shopping, uh, and we have an orientation that way. If you look even at the way that we manage growth in Cupertino, and we've done a fair job of managing growth, the sole tool we use is called the level of service. That's how we know if, it's, if you can build a, a new office here or a new home here. We look at the level of service. What is the level of service? It's how long you back up in an intersection in your car. That's our tool. So we're, it's no wonder that we are very car oriented. And it's a pretty good place to drive a car through, except if you live near a school, but that's another matter. But for the most part, it's pretty easy to get across town. Uh, you can get almost anywhere in 10 minutes in, in Cupertino. You can get to a freeway quickly. Uh, and that's because we've had this automobile orientation. We're pretty good at that. But it's not so good for community. It means you have lots of pavement. You don't have a lot of people. People are scared to walk out there. Another challenge to building community um, is constructive integration of newcomers. Okay, what does that say? We have a lot of immigration in Cupertino. Everybody knows that. We have a lot of new people. Uh, they don't all look the same as the old people. The mm, people that have been here longer. Um, and we have to be good about bringing them into our community. We don't want to have two communities or three communities or four communities. We want to have one community. And how do you do that? You do that through finding your commonality and stressing your commonality and honoring your differences. But we need work on that, and it's a challenge for us. And finally, we have a real issue, uh, which we'll talk about at some length. Our kids don't feel like we like them, uh, and, uh, and we'll get to that. So what are we planning to do about all this? The economy. 
um, monitor and be cautious. We have uh, we set something in place now where twice a month um, we endure this boring report from Carol. Carol, sorry, Carol, it's your it's your job. But uh, well, we we look at all the revenues and all the expenses twice a month to be sure we're on track. Why? Well, other cities, uh, Palo Alto has a hiring freeze. Uh, San Jose has a hiring freeze. The county has a new hiring freeze. The um, VTA, who provides our roads, uh, they're delaying projects. We're not doing that, but the danger signs are there. And so we have to watch, uh, and we're watching carefully. And twice a month, the council gets an update so that if the alarm bell goes off, we can start doing some of those things. Next, I'm gonna do a sh some shameless campaigning here for Measure M. Uh, Measure M will be on your March ballot. Uh, it's, the, it's the tool that we need in order to keep the reserves sound while building this library and our other big capital improvement projects. It's the tool we need to, to uh, refinance our, uh, our general fund and the capital projects that it supports. Um, and what it does and what we are asking you to do is to extend the uh, utility tax. Right now the utility tax it was very useful. It helped us um, by Blackberry Farm and Creekside Park, uh, which are great purchases and great assets to the city. It runs out in 2015, which seems like a long way out, but if you want to refinance at today's attractive rates um, and, and get some more money with, out of the system without doing a new tax, that's the way. So we would like to push the sunset out on that tax to 2030, and we hope you can support that. Okay, um, the other thing that you'll see coming up in the library, we had to get creative when uh, we inherited the job of funding the library without, without a bond or something like that. You know, it's, Saratoga was easy. They went out, they got a bond, pays for the whole library, but it pays a little more tax and you're done. But we didn't do that. We didn't take that approach. Uh, and part of what we did in the end, ultimately, to be sure we could build a, a library that was adequate and would last us a long time, I was we asked the community to raise some money. And um, uh, so there's, there'll be a community fundraiser, one more person coming to you and asking you for some money. Uh, they're gonna try to raise $1.2 million of the library budget. We are sharing the pain with the community, again, uh, but we ask your support if you love libraries uh, to, to uh, give to that library specific campaign. Uh, and Dorothy is here and she will take your checks. <laughs> there's Dorothy, <laughs> Dorothy Stowe. Uh, we should applaud that whole campaign. Okay, on housing, um, you know, we do some housing programs. Uh, the, you know, the issue is affordable housing, uh, and we have helped a lot with the Cupertino Community Services Project to build housing on Stevens Creek Boulevard. Uh, it's a great program, but it's 24 units, and it looks like we need 2,300, so it's, that's not going to work. It costs too much money. But we do have tools to help us, and that's the general plan. Uh, so we're going to update our general plan to, to emphasize affordable housing and de-emphasize uh, office, uh, because we don't want to make that jobs housing thing any worse. Um, and we're going to ask for your help. The Community Congress this, this year in May will be your chance to come and tell us what you think uh, Cupertino should look like. Where should we have growth? How much growth should we have? What should it look like? Uh, we're going to go to the community and ask for your help to define what your city will look like during the next 10 years and how things will change. Uh, so we have a public process, but the most important focus, I think, will be that community congress meeting. Uh, if we can only find a location, we're having a little difficulty there. Um, but uh, we, need, we need your help to, to update our general plan. Okay, on this issue of our Im immigration uh, and its impact on community. Um, we, we have gone through phases with this. We went through a phase where we all mad at each other because of Chinese signs, you know, no English signs, or what to do with our festivals and how to integrate newcomers into our festivals. Uh, and we, we have talked endlessly about uh, words, right, about rhetoric, uh, about language. But we, we got through that. We are now what I would call in peaceful coexistence. We have two different co communities. The child psychologists call it parallel play. We're both off in our worlds, and we're doing fine, right? There aren't really big issues. 
we're doing fine in our world, but they are separate worlds, and it's not as good as it could be. It is better when we have a single community, when we integrate our communities, we respect our differences, but we do things together. Uh, and we're gonna work on that in the city, and there's a, a few things which I'll mention that are our, our start on that. Here's a few, we've improved communication. Um, it turns out 24% of our people are Chinese speaking. Um, they often read a couple of Chinese newspapers. There's the World Journal, I think represented here today, and, and Tsingtao Daily. Um, th we're not hearing them, and they're not hearing us, if the, if the languages of the newspapers we read are different. Right? I don't know what's going on in their community. I read the Valley section of the Mercury News every day, religiously, cover to cover. Uh, I read the Cupertino Courier the same way every week, and I read the scene the same way every month. But that 24% of our population, our access has been limited. Um, so we started a program, and it's working great, and Rick, you've done a, a great job with that. Um, so that the, anything that goes in those newspapers that pertains to Cupertino gets translated into English and shared with the council and the, and the city staff. It's a simple step, but it lets us know what's happening in that community. And we, it lets us know the buzz of that community. And similarly now, we do our notices in, in those newspapers <coughs> because it's only fair uh, to share our news with them too. Uh, so um, that's an important bridge. Now we have some, a couple of smaller things they are just steps. These are just small steps to get into, away from the parallel play mode. Small steps, but the Lunar New Year Parade. We've decided to have a Lunar New Year Parade. You know, like they have in San Francisco with the dragon and the kids and the lanterns and the dancers and the drums and the firecrackers. Um, and we're gonna do that together. We're gonna do it in the community. Uh, we've already pulled together an ad hoc committee. We're looking for new members. Uh, but we don't want this to be the Chinese festival or the Caucasian's version of a Chinese New Year or whatever. This is something we're going to do together. And the committee is a rainbow committee. It's got all the diversity that, that you'd want. We'll take more. Uh, but it's a little step. And the nice thing about it is that we're working on it together. And the nice thing on it is we're trying to attract people from across our broad spectrum. Measure M, it's gonna be a borderless campaign. Uh, you know, these are the, just little things that, opportunities that come in front of us that let us help build a united community. Um, but Measure M is of interest to me, the council members are all supporting it. Um, but we, now we have this very interesting thing. We've got the broad community. There, is, there are no segments about this supporting it. These are people that are just interested in having solid financial footings in the city and they believe in our capital improvement program. They believe in the library as a good project, in the parks, and things like that. We are intentionally having a broad representation there. We're, we're, doing, we're crossing a traditional border in, in Cupertino. We're having a big fundraiser, when is that, February 13th, I think, uh, at Cuisinier 6. Cuisinier 6, that's a signal to some people. Cuisinier 6 is where the Asian candidates tend to have their, their fundraisers, when they're running for city council or whatever. Um, but we're going to have a broad fundraiser there. We're going to throw off the traditional separations here and forget about our differences for a minute to work on our commonalities. And there's a lot more to be done, and I'm sure you've got great ideas about how to do that. So next, work to let youth know we value them. What does that mean? Uh, we have a danger sign in the community, and I think one we shouldn't ignore. Uh, and it is one that we have ignored, uh, but it is, it is possible to become a very serious issue, and I think it's time to take action. So there's this group that spun off of uh, joint venture Silicon Valley called the Cornerstone Project, and they did some measuring around, some surveying around our county about, about kids. The Cornerstone Project is a very interesting thing you may want to get into, but I can't touch on it hardly today. Um, but they did a survey and they found only 10% of the kids in Cupertino feel valued by their community. That says nine out of 10 of the kids that you talk to think their community doesn't value them. That's a serious problem. You know, how do you expect them to grow up if they don't think we care about them? 
what will happen as they grow up? And we're the lowest in the county. Uh, I think we need to take action. As individuals, we do a tremendous amount. I was shocked by this because of, I see the volunteerism that goes on. I see fundraisers. Like, well, we're going to talk about the crab feeds, right? We're doing these crab feeds on uh, February 15th and, and uh, April 5th. Those are to raise money for kids' projects. So you've got all these adults in there serving up crab to raise money for kids. You see in, in schools, in the, in, when uh, Ellen uh, and I, our kids were going through the <laughs> elementary schools, there were so many volunteers in the classroom, they couldn't use us all. They were oversubscribed. They, didn't have an, they wanted to have us leave uh, because there was so much help. But the kids aren't getting the messages. They don't know. And we could do more anyway. So I think the city needs to follow through with some of the teen programs and facilities. And what this takes is political courage a lot of times because it's difficult to find places for teen activities, uh, for places like things like skate parks, right, or teen centers. Who wants that in their neighborhood? Well, I'm telling you, it's a danger sign and we're gonna have to compromise and we're gonna need your help to find places for these kind of things. And today we start a program called We Value Youth uh, in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce, the YMCA, our Teen Commission, and the Cornerstone Project where we're working on this issue. And we're gonna brand it. And pretty soon you'll hear We Value Youth all the time because we need to get this message to the kids that we do value them, that we are doing things for them and we could do more and we need to listen to them about what they would consider being valued. And besides, they'll have a better name. Okay, and finally, I'm, you know, the, the favorite words in a speech like this is in conclusion. I'm not quite there yet, but, and I know you're looking for it, but I'll, I'll get there. Um, we need to develop a pet pedestrian orientation. This thing where we have all the cars and everybody drives in and out and our streets are wide and you're scared to walk on them, it's a, it's a problem for Cupertino. It's something that you say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do about it. It's, we're stuck with it. We grew up that way, there's no fixing it. But it's not good uh, and I think we should try. Uh, we do want people out of their cars and we do want people going and having a cup of coffee and chatting and we do want people uh, of, of all colors and backgrounds and everything else uh, out there together. We do want to run into the, the sheriffs over there at the donut wheel. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, it's time to get out of the car. Um, and so this council and the previous council are, have both been dedicated to this and slow in making progress. It's really tough. So a few things on the trails. This year we're going to build our first trail. That's going to be remarkable because we've talked about them endlessly. Uh, the first one will be a little one uh, over in the Rancho Rinconada area. But it's kind of nice. They don't have a park there. When we annexed them recently, uh, they came in with no park. And one of the things in Cupertino that we strive for is everybody has a park, a neighborhood park within a mile of their home. These guys don't have it. They were part of the, the county and in uh, that just wasn't in their history to have a park. So we're giving them what's called a linear park. That's a tricky thing, you know. A guy that wants a trail calls it a linear park because then you get a whole bunch of new people interested. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it, it's, a, it's an amenity for them. It's on a great piece of, of uh, unspoiled creek um, and we're gonna build it. And we're looking at how to do the Stevens Creek Trail, a tough thing to work with the neighbors and find something that works for them. And we just finished a, a study of uh, putting a trail next to the railroad tracks that would let you walk or ride your bicycle all the way from Rancho San Antonio down to Vasona without going on the roads. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, we know how to do it now, but we got to convince the railroad to help us a little. Um, and, uh, and we're talking about just down the street here, uh, an over, uh, overcrossing for pedestrians and bicycles over Mary Avenue. You know, it was designed at one time for a car exit. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, this is a, is, it's right in the middle of the county's trails plan of how you should be able to ride a bike. If somebody wants to ride a bike to De Anza College, a lot of people, 40,000 people, I think, are enrolled at De Anza College. Wouldn't it be nice if some of them could ride their bicycle from Sunnyvale uh, to De Anza College? Um, and so this project has made it to the number one, uh, the top of the list at VTA for their pedestrian projects. Good news about being on the top of the list of VTA, they pay. 
And we have to pay a little, right? We have to pay, I think it's 10%. But uh, they've got it there. They've got it funded. They want to increase uh, uh, walkability, pedestrians and bikes uh, in the county. Uh, and so they'll pay. Now some of the more detailed things. Uh, Mary Avenue, uh, right over here. Mary Avenue was designed as a freeway exit. Um, and so it's big. And people drive fast. And it serves a small little neighborhood. It was designed, right, to serve Highway 280. It was designed so we wouldn't have that stressful intersection at the corner of 85, Stevens Creek, De Anza College, and everything else. Uh, it wasn't supposed to work out that way. So we have this Mary Avenue, it's gigantic, and people drive a million miles an hour. And it's too bad, because what it does is it puts a moat around some of our great, uh, our great facilities in the city. Um, wouldn't it be nice if you could walk from, let's say, the senior center over to Jamba Juice and, and our new Togo's going in there, uh, maybe over to, to Hobie's and pick up a picnic lunch and go back over and sit by the ducks and have your lunch and maybe sneak them a little bread. Um, well, wouldn't that be nice? But you can't do it now. The street's too scary. And what we observed was during the festivals, actually during this year's Oktoberfest, this year's, last year's Oktoberfest, um, that the Rotarians went out there and put up some cones and made it so that the cars couldn't go very fast through there. It was narrow, and it was really nice. And everybody was walking across. And all it took was a little traffic control, slowing down those cars a little bit, and it turned into a nice thing. So we're going to fix that this year. It's, uh, it's a small project in that it, you know, it's a real pinpoint thing, but it's a start. We want to turn the ship, right? We want to turn the ship away from the orientation to cars and toward an orientation for pedestrians and bicycles. We, now we're taking on the big one here, the, the city, center, city center intersection. That's the corner of Stevens Creek and De Anza, uh, a gigantic piece of pavement. Uh, but we, we'll, we're going to take it on. We're going to do our best to improve it. Uh, you know, we're, we're building a new park there at the corner of Stevens Creek and De Anza. It would be nice if you could walk from there and go to Starbucks and pick up your coffee and walk back. It's too scary. You're not going to do it today. It's too big and too scary. And finally, we're building the, the Cypress Hotel and Restaurant there, uh, which will reinvigorate that corner. Uh, it'll give us a little nightlife. It'll give us a fine restaurant. Um, it'll give people a reason to walk. You know, part of, part of walking is having a destination, and uh, we need to work on that. So it'll kind of complement the, the uh, Crossroads Shopping Center. New projects that we're doing all have this walkability component, and, uh, and our our planning and community development staff, led by Steve Piasecki, has been great about working with every applicant to say this is what we need to make a walkable city. So we have the new mixed use project there. It used to be PJ Mulligan's. Now it's going to be housing and retail and office all in one spot and a little buzz of activity. Uh, almost across the street from there, the Marketplace Center, you'll remember a lot of failed restaurants there. Uh, your favorite, I don't know, Harry's Hofbrau House or something. Um, but that's changing too. The, the buildings are going to come up to the street. They're going to have tables out there so you can sit there on Stevens Creek Boulevard and, and see people uh, and make it an interesting place to be. Similarly, Target and Mervyn's is, is jumping into this fray. They want to do it too. They want to have their buildings by the street. They want people walking. They want people to actually be able to walk from Target to Mervyn's. What a concept. They're so far apart. You know, what, it's by 200 yards, right? Uh, but not possible today. Um, and so we're going to look at possible reconfiguration of Stevens Creek Boulevard to make that more attractive. And similar, we talked about this uh, at other t times, but the Civic Center, uh, that's where City Hall is. Nobody calls it the Civic Center today. Um, but we want to make it into a Civic Center and part of the design of the library. And we've been in tremendous fights with our, art, our library architects about this. We want it to be a place to go. We want it to be a gathering place. We want to have a civic center. We want the library and city hall and this new development, retail uh, office, professional office development that's going to go across the street to all be integrated into a nice place to go. So before I run out of time, there's a lot of skepticism about the ability to pull off the walkability business. So I brought some slides to help us all visualize uh, what it means. Here's typical Cupertino, right? Maybe Bub Road or, or Prune Ridge Avenue, something like that. We have these buildings. 
Uh, not too inviting, not a lot of people walking there. Uh, not exactly the walkable city. Um, but you can make some changes, changes like we're planning at Mary Avenue. Now, there's not a lot different. There's not a lot different. We widen the sidewalk. We put a little place here to wait for the bus or park your bicycle. We put a nice crosswalk here, a refuge island it's called in the middle, uh, and suddenly it starts to feel a little better. You add a business, you pull one of the, bu the businesses up to the, to the sidewalk, and suddenly it becomes an interesting place to walk. You might peek in there and see what they're planning, the next high-tech thing or something. Uh, and, and so you start to get a few people walking. You do it on the other side, and the strange thing happens. For some reason, adding these tall buildings makes it feel better for pedestrians. Right? And these guys have all figured it out. And Steve is, understands all this. There's, there's a science behind this, about the size of the building relative to the width of the street. But we have these businesses like Target and Mervyn that want to do this, want to make it attractive to walk there. Uh, and this is the same street. Let's see if I can get this to go backwards. That'll be a challenge. Same street as this one. Same street. Right? We change the sidewalks and we move the buildings to the front. Okay, let's look at a couple of others. Ah, typical. The ocean of pavement. We have these, right? Uh, if you look at, at the, most of our big stores have this big, gigantic parking lot in front. Do you want to walk there? What's, this, what's with this guy? That guy, what's he doing? Where's he going? And does he feel safe out there, you know? The poor guy in the red jacket. So you put in a building. Um, okay, there's ups and downs. You, you want buildings, you don't want buildings. Well, we need some buildings, we need some housing. Uh, we're gonna do something. These guys wanna update their buildings. What if you move them to the street? It starts to feel a little better, add a few trees. Housing, okay, you can put in a little bit denser housing here. You remember we've got this problem. We don't have much space for these houses. We're gonna to have to go up. Well, you can do them kind of nice. There's some of these going in across the street from De Anza College. Why? Because teachers and students that are there need a place to live. So you can do them a little denser and they can be nice. And you start to see some people walking. Why? Well, there's a few things to do. There's a little cafe here, uh, enough density so there's some people. You put in some pedestrian Amenities, these don't cost much, right, Ralph? Well, he's got the biggest budget, he's gotta spend it on something. Um, you put in some trees, again, refuge islands. That says the poor pedestrian doesn't have to make it all the way in one light, you know? He gets to stop if he runs out of gas here in the middle, uh, and he can wait. This guy is starting to look a little safer. It's, it's actually pretty, pretty nice now for pedestrian. Okay, here's a familiar one. This is El Camino Real, and we've all seen these places. These are really old fashioned, like 50s car washes. Um, but it's desolate, right? The most interesting thing here are the cones. Um, and we've seen places like this, and frankly, Cupertino has some places like this, right? And they, they just aren't much fun to look at. They're not much fun to walk around in. You're not gonna get people walking when it feels like that. All we did here was add some trees and commit one lane to the bus, right? Put a little bulb out here for people to wait. It's feeling a lot better already. This is pretty simple things that we know how to do. You move the buildings up, you do your growth here where you've got the bus so you don't have the extra traffic, and you've got interesting things to see in these windows. Go in and buy a donut, whatever you're gonna do, um, but it feels an awful lot better than that big open parking lot with the, uh, with the car wash in the background. Here's one, boy, this looks like uh, Lawrence Expressway and Stevens Creek to me, kind of. They got that big thing there. Just add trees, the pedestrian stuff, it's like night and day. You put in a cafe here, a, a Borders bookstore over here, you replace the pavement with some fake bricks, and voila, you've got Paris, you know? <laughs> uh, it can be nice. This stuff is doable. Those slides, uh, were, we, didn't, we didn't spend any city money on that. We got those for free from Joint Venture Silicon Valley. Uh, so let, let me just, I, I, I'm gonna wrap up here, but there's some frequently asked questions. I'm gonna answer them quickly uh, so that you don't have to ask them. What's going on at Valco? Nothing. Uh, the guys that own the property, 
The guys that are on the property are sitting on their duffs and we've tried everything to move them and they won't move. Uh, they, who knows, we might get them to sell. We've tried that too, uh, but nothing's going on. What's going on with the Oaks Theater? Well, Andronico's was gonna come in and the recession hit and they ran out of dough. Uh, so nothing. And there, I tell you, there's a lot of people either secretly or not so secretly applauding because they like the theaters anyway. Uh, what's going on with that big space of land at Tantau and Stevens Creek Boulevard? That's the compact land. Well, they're trying to figure out if they work for HP or compact, and that's all they care about. <laughs> so they're not doing anything. Uh, there's, a, there's a few of them here today enjoying a lunch, but uh, well, we haven't heard from those guys ever since Carly had the big idea. So, uh, so nothing there either. What's going on in the skate park? We're looking for a home for the skate park. It's very challenging. People don't want these in their neighborhood. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's been tough. We have ordered a portable one that we can take around on the trailer and do something for our kids. Uh, and so no neighbor will have to put up with it for very long and we'll, pu we'll put it in the uh, city hall lot first. We'll take our, our, our drubbing first. Um, uh, but, so we're gonna do something, but we do need to find a home for it. Uh, and what's all that building at the city center? Well, there's a, there's a classy hotel going on, if you've, uh, going up there. That if you've been to the Hotel Monaco in San Francisco, that's, it's the same developer, the Kimpton Group. Uh, if you like fine restaurants, um, what's the name of the one in Berlin Games? Culetto's. That's who's putting in the restaurant. It's going to be a fine restaurant, uh, something to be proud of, a reason to go there. We're going to build a nice little park out in front there, not city land. They're giving us the land to use for that. Um, and it'll be the beginning of a place to go. I hear there might be a Starbucks, a new Starbucks down there, uh, and it, it's gonna be oriented toward nightlife, it's gonna be lit, the park will be lit, people will be moving in and out of the park and into these places, so it should be nice. Summary, possibilities. We're gonna turn the ship toward walkability and interesting places to go. That's all we can commit to is turning the ship, starting some momentum in that direction. We can't finish this in maybe my lifetime, I don't know, but not in a term, anyway. But we want to turn the ship toward walkability. We want to start the path toward having homes for everybody that works here. That's the goal. The people that work here, the firefighters, the, the police, the school teachers, the school administrators, the people working for the city, they ought to have a home here. That's the goal. The goal is if you work here, you ought to be able to live here. We will, through mutual respect, become better neighbors. This means we're gonna to learn to play together, not so much parallel play. We're gonna work at letting youth know that we value them, and we're gonna prevail through the recession with solid management. Don't worry about that. Thank you for your attention.